Chapter 6 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Towards 4 o'clock the condition of the English army was serious. The Prince of Orange was in command of the centre, Hill of the right wing, Picton of the left wing. The Prince of Orange, desperate and intrepid, shouted to the Hollando-Belgians, Nassau. Brunswick. Never retreat. Hill, having been weakened, had come up. To the support of Wellington, Picton was dead. At the very moment when the English had captured from the French the flag of the 105th of the line, the French had killed the English general, Picton, with a bullet through the head. The battle had, for Wellington, two bases of action, Hogament and La High Saint, Hogament still held out, but was on fire, La High Saint was taken. Of the German battalion which defended it, only 42 men survived, all the officers, except five were either dead or captured. Three thousand combatants had been massacred in that barn. A sergeant of the English guards, the foremost boxer in England, reputed invulnerable by his companions, had been killed there by a little French drummer boy. Bering had been dislodged, Alton put to the sword. Many flags had been lost, one from Alton's division, and one from the battalion of Lunenburg, carried by a prince of the house of Duponts. The Scotch Greys no longer existed, Ponsonby's great dragoons had been hacked to pieces. That valiant cavalry had bent beneath the lancers of Bro and beneath the cuirassiers of Traverse, out of twelve hundred horses, six hundred remained, out of three lieutenant colonels, two lay on the earth, Hamilton wounded, Motter slain. Ponsonby had fallen, riddled by seven lance thrusts. Gordon was dead. Marsh was dead. Two divisions, the 5th and the 6th, had been annihilated. Hogament injured, La High Saint taken, there now existed but one rallying point, the centre. That point still held firm. Wellington reinforced it. He summoned Thither Hill, who was at Merle Brain, he summoned Chasse, who was at Brain El Alarid. The centre of the English army, rather concave, very dense, and very compact, was strongly posted. It occupied the plateau of Mont Saint. Jean, having behind it the village, and in front of it the slope, which was tolerably steep then. It rested on that stout stone dwelling which at that time belonged to the domain of Nivelles, and which marks the intersection of the roads a pile of the 16th century, and so robust that the cannon balls rebounded from it without injuring it. All about the plateau the English had cut the hedges here and there, made embrasures in the hawthorn trees thrust the throat of a cannon. Between two branches, embattled the shrubs. Their artillery was ambushed in the brushwood. This Punic labor, incontestably authorized by war, which permits traps, was so well done, that Haxo, who had been dispatched by the emperor at nine o'clock in the morning to reconnoiter the enemy's batteries, had discovered nothing of it, and had returned and reported to Napoleon that there were no obstacles except the two barricades which barred the road to Nivelles and to Genappe. It was at the season when the grain is tall, on the edge of the plateau a battalion of Kemp's brigade, the 95th, armed with carabins, was concealed in the tall wheat. Thus assured and buttressed, the centre of the Anglo-Dutch army was well posted. The peril of this position lay in the forest of Soines then adjoining the field of battle, and intersected by the ponds of Grenendale and Boyd's Fort. An army could not retreat thither without dissolving, the regiments would have broken up immediately there. The artillery would have been lost among the morasses. The retreat, according to many a man versed in the art, though it is disputed by others, would have been a disorganized flight. To this centre, Wellington added one of Chasse's brigades taken from the right wing, and one of Wink's brigades taken from the left wing, plus Clinton's division. To his English, to the regiments of Hockett, to the brigades of Mitchell, to the guards of Maitland, he gave as reinforcements and aids, the infantry of Brunswick, Nassau's contingent, Kielmansegg's Hanoverians, and Omtida's Germans. This placed twenty-six battalions under his hand. The right wing, as Charles says, was thrown back on the centre. An enormous battery was masked by sacks of earth at the spot where there now stands what is called the Museum of Waterloo. 
Besides this, Wellington had, behind a rise in the ground, Somerset's Dragoon Guards, 1400 horse strong. It was the remaining half of the justly celebrated English cavalry. Ponsonby destroyed, Somerset remained. The battery, which, if completed, would have been almost a redoubt, was ranged behind a very low garden wall, backed up with a coating of bags of sand and a large slope of earth. This work was not finished, there had been no time to make a palisade for it. Wellington, uneasy but impassive, was on horseback, and there remained the whole day in the same attitude, a little in advance of the old mill of Mont Saint Jean, which is still in existence, beneath an elm, which an Englishman, an enthusiastic vandal, purchased later on for two hundred francs, cut down, and carried off. Wellington was coldly heroic. The bullets rained about him. His aide de camp, Gordon, fell at his side. Lord Hill, pointing to a shell which had burst, said to him, My lord, what are your orders in case you are killed? To do like me, replied Wellington. To Clinton he said laconically, to hold this spot to the last man. The day was evidently turning out ill. Wellington shouted to his old companions of Talavera, of Vittoria, of Salamanca, boys, can retreat be thought of? Think of old England. Towards four o'clock, the English line drew back. Suddenly nothing was visible on the crest of the plateau except the artillery and the sharpshooters, the rest had disappeared, the regiments, dislodged by the shells and the French bullets, retreated into the bottom, now intersected by the back road of the farm of Mont Saint Jean, a retrograde movement took place, the English front hid itself, Wellington drew back. The beginning of retreat, cried Napoleon. Chapter 7 Napoleon in a Good Humor